to figure out the theme of uh, this year's uh, symposium, it was really a no-brainer. Uh, we have a new administration in office uh, with a commitment um, to justice reform. Uh, how that will work out is really going to be the subject uh, of our first panel, whether it can happen bipartisan, in a bipartisan manner, uh, as seemed to begin in the last administration as well. And to take us through that, um, I'm really honored to have as our moderator, Adam Gelb, who's the president of the Council on Criminal Justice. And again, um, uh, to see his Adam's full bio, and as well as the bio of all the panelists we have today, I think we're still missing one uh, who hasn't come up yet, but I'll hand the gavel over to Adam. Adam, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Steve. <clears throat> it's great to be with you. you know, I'm, I'm remembering <clears throat> this morning that uh, like a year ago, uh, this event was probably the last thing that I did out of the house before everything locked down. And maybe that's true for you and Dan and and, and many others. So uh, just a uh, just uh, conjuring a lot of a lot of feelings this morning, and uh, including just pride, uh, uh, Steve, for you and for Dan and and uh, HF Guggenheim Foundation for uh, uh, for continuing this series. I think it's 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 become um, you know an, an annual event that is is just an important gathering place for so many people uh, across this field, and 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 I hope you hope you feel that. Um, uh, I wish actually I had had opportunities like this uh, when I was a, a reporter. Um, uh, for those that peeked at the bio, I started my career uh, uh, in the cop shop at the Atlanta Journal Constitution back in the in, back in the 80s. Um, and honestly, I was running from story to story. Uh, that was high of the drug war, of course. So there's a lot going on, and and um, I, I never really took the the time to step back uh, and get some context uh, and critical background about the bigger issues. You know, I, honestly, at the time I. I think I thought I knew a whole lot about uh, about these things, but uh, certainly I uh, hope I, I hope I know a good bit more, and wish I had had opportunities like this to um, to step back and very much appreciate those of you uh, the reporters, uh, uh, writers, uh, producers, columnists, others who joined today um, to, to do exactly that. So as Steve said, I'm uh, uh, president and CEO of a, a, a relatively new organization called the Council on Criminal Justice. Uh, we're an uh, independent, nonpartisan uh, think tank and an invitational membership organization. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we have a, sort of a two-part mission statement. One is to advance understanding of the criminal justice policy choices facing the nation. And then second, to build consensus for solutions that advance safety and justice for all. Uh, we're certainly going to do the first part of that today. Um, and I hope we can do a little bit of the second as well uh, with, this, with this terrific panel. Uh, uh, but in the spirit of that first one, I want to take a minute before we kick into gear. Now, Steve has given us a big chunk of time this morning. I'm going to just take a, a quick minute to, to uh, focus on that first part, which is try to ground this conversation in, in some basic facts. Uh, I know Professor Bloomstein and, and uh, uh, Rosenfeld are going to come after uh, and go much deeper than I'm going to go here. But if I had if I had sort of one uh, key message that that I'd want to uh, that I want to put out there this morning to, to kick this session off. It is that things are changing. Uh, they're 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 changing in many ways significantly, and I'm going to give you a few uh, a, a few examples here. Uh, crime is uh, way down in this country from where it was at the beginning of the '90s. Violent crime is down by about 50 percent. Uh, property crime by more than that. Now there's been a recent uptick uh, and and spike in homicides. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, but overall, crime levels are down significantly from they were, uh, where they were in the 90s. Arrests are way down. There used to be uh, at the height, um, uh, the peak of, of arrests in this country, about 15 million people a year, a year arrested. That's down to about 10 million a, uh, a year now. So a drop by about a third in the number of people who are arrested. Uh, correctional populations are also way down. Uh, back in 2008, uh, uh, when I was at the Pew Charitable Trust, we documented that uh, there were one out of every 100 adults in this country behind bars, 2.3 million people out of about 230 million adults. Uh, just a stunning, uh, a stunning level of incarceration. Uh, that, uh, before the pandemic, had dropped down to about 1.9 million. And uh, with, with uh, a reduced flow of people coming in and some releases, 
uh, uh, Vera Institute of Justice just reported uh, in the last few weeks that uh, at the end of last year, that is down to 1.8. So 2.3 million has become 1.8 million. Uh, attention, you know, webmasters and, and, and people who, who um, uh, just sort of reflexively put in 2.3 million now. Uh, there are half a million fewer people uh, behind bars uh, today than there were uh, about 10, 12 years ago. Uh, racial disparities are also down. Um, uh, the ratio of uh, blacks uh, to whites in prison uh, uh, was eight to one at, in about 2000. It's down to about five to one uh, uh, as of a couple of years ago. Um, and there have been particularly steep drops in disparities uh, for drug offenses. Uh, in 2000, uh, there were uh, 15 blacks um, for every white in, um, in prison for drugs, that's down to five to one. So drop by two thirds in, a, in the drug imprisonment disparity. And then um, uh, for women, uh, there's been a significant uh, drop as well. It used to be six to one blacks to whites, uh, women in prison, that's down to two to one. And that's both because uh, black women are, uh, population is reducing and the, and the population of white women is increasing. So um, I, I, I should say one other thing here um, that's not, that hasn't changed. And, and frankly, the, the, the one thing that hasn't changed is the one thing that gets, uh, I think, most often reported as something that has changed, and that's law enforcement uh, spending. Um, in straight up dollars, spending on police in this country has, uh, uh, has gone up and it's gone up markedly. But the policy relevant question is, uh, is to look at what percent of total state and local spending uh, is on law enforcement. And when you look at that, it's actually amazing how flat that line is. It's flat as a pancake. Uh, in fact, the percent of total state and local spending, so that's spending on education and health programs and uh, other social services and roads, um, uh, the percent of spending on law enforcement uh, has remained at 3.7%. It's bumped up and down maybe by half a percent, but it's, it's, it's actually uh, incredible how, uh, how flat that's been over time. So bottom line, just the theme, the theme here is, is, uh, is, of course, you know, for a lot of people, those changes uh, feel incremental. Uh, they're nowhere near far enough, nowhere near deep enough. Um, and obviously, there's still so much work to be done. I don't know anybody who's, who's got that mission accomplished uh, banner flying out there. But, but there are some overall positive uh, developments amidst, uh, you know, amidst so much uh, gloom and doom uh, these days. Um, and, and if I might, uh, you know, news. Uh, news is about when things change. It's not only about when things go wrong or are bad, uh, but even when things uh, change for the better. Um, and so I, I just wanted to put that out there as, as sort of background as we, as we kick into not only this session here, but, I, but hopefully the whole, uh, uh, Steve and Dan, hopefully the, the, the whole terrific program over the next couple of days. Um, we do have a fabulous panel. I'm gonna introduce them very quickly and then we'll kick into gear here. Um, uh, just going in alpha order, uh, we've got Brandon Garrett. Uh, Brandon clerked uh, as a, uh, on, on the Federal Second uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, he teaches at Duke Law School now, uh, having defected from UVA, my alma mater, so I'm still trying to forgive him for that, but uh, great to be with you, uh, Brandon. Uh, we have Christine Leonard, uh, who is one of the, the few people who's uh, worked in all three branches uh, of government. Um, she's, uh, she worked at ONDCP, in the executive branch. Uh, she worked at the U.S. Sentencing Commission in the judicial branch. She's now counsel at the uh, House Judiciary uh, uh, Committee. And so terrific breadth of experience, not only in government, but also leading positions in the nonprofit world uh, at the Vera Institute of Justice and the Coalition for Public Safety. And uh, we're also joined by uh, Stephen Townsend, uh, uh, comes out of uh, UT Law School and is a legislative director for Senator Cornyn, uh, handling immigration and finance and uh, and a whole bunch of stuff as well as uh, as well as criminal justice uh, issues. So uh, terrific to be with the three of you this morning. Um, we're going to have a, a conversation. Uh, I hope we can do in about four segments. Uh, we're going to kick uh, straight into gear with uh, politics, uh, and then we're going to focus on a handful of issues for. Uh, for a decent chunk of time. There'll probably be some issues that we don't hit uh, that, that we might do a speed round on. And then uh, last, of course, we'll, we'll uh, get to the audience for, for Q&A. So <clears throat> jumping right in on the politics, um, uh, the House was supposed to vote today on the George Floyd Act. They ended up voting last night. 
uh, on account of, as I understand it, uh, fears of, uh, of potential disruption at the Capitol today. Uh, and the vote was uh, incredibly close. I mean, just by just by uh, passed just by a handful of votes. And I think the question is, when you when you look at that uh, coming out of the, the last major uh, really major piece of criminal justice legislation that came out of Congress, which was the First Step Act at the end of uh, at the end of 2018, and that passed the Senate, if I recall correctly, by uh, uh, vote of uh, 88 with, with 88 votes, and in the House here, uh, we're we're you know just just on the razor's uh, edge with that bill passing. So, um, uh, Christine, if I could turn to you first and just just ask, you know, what what is your sense of the the bipartisan coalition at this point is it is it frayed substantially since since a couple of years ago? Well, thank you, Adam. And let me just pause for a moment to thank Dan Wilhelm and Stephen from John Jay for uh, putting on this great panel and including me in the discussion. Um, you've laid out uh, some very important facts uh, about where we stand right now uh, statistically, and I and I hope that those are facts that everyone can agree upon regardless of their role or their political persuasion. But I, I, I think that it is very important to pause and to think about what the climate is like right now on Capitol Hill. Um, you know, I was up last week for votes and um, had some time to reflect about the fact that 24 years ago, I started for a freshman from Massachusetts, Jim McGovern, who is now sitting as the chairman of the Rules Committee. and. That first week in Congress with him as a freshman, even though he was a veteran House staffer, um, it's it's a really challenging environment. And I think you know to sit there now and to look around at these new members of Congress and their staff who are in the middle of a pandemic. Seems like we lost Christine. And we're all still working that now that Speaker Pelosi has implemented a mandate on masks, but it's also about personal safety. I would never have expected to return to work um, and see the faces of the young members of the National Guard. And, you know, every day I am getting an update from the Department of Justice about another indictment, um, now close to 300 of individuals who will face charges for the breach of the Capitol. I think it is so important, you know, as we move forward in this discussion, that people appreciate and understand that this, this event was so significant in terms of how people think about their own personal safety and why it's so critical at this juncture that we're able to still build personal relationships that allow us to move forward with the work. So while I agree with you that, you know, there are signs of progress across the country and there's lots of opportunities of areas where we should be able to come together and find opportunities for reform. I think it is so important that we also pause and acknowledge that for many people involved in this work, that the historic legacy of how we got here is very important to acknowledge in terms of how we move forward. But I would also say their own personal experiences right now are going to be a factor in how we can talk about this work and, and agree upon a, a common set of facts in order to move forward. Thanks, Christine. Uh, Stephen, uh, your, your perspective on this. So thank, first of all, thank you all for having me. Um, I know it's a, it's a very busy time for everyone and a, you know, and, and a hard time for everyone. And uh, I just, I really appreciate the opportunity to participate. Um, I, I think what I would say is, you know, in, in my time up here, not, not as seasoned as, as Christine on the Hill, but um, in my time up here, uh, I, I found there's, there's never a good time to make progress and there's never a bad time either. Um, it's, the politics can line up um, on particular issues, no matter what the environment, the, the broader political environment is. Um, and, you know, everything's always politicized up here. So, you know, like Christine said, the, the most important part is going to be, you know, I, I think 
particularly on some subsets of criminal justice, there are agreed upon facts that, uh, you know, uh, both sides can stipulate to. And um, there are ways to address those facts where both sides can view themselves as, you know, achieving their objectives, right? It, it, we can come to agreement for very different reasons, right? And I, I think you saw, I think First Step Act was, you know, a great example of that. You know, that, that bill had been under development since uh, about 2011. Um, and really, frankly, throughout the process, and Christine can attest to this, did not change very much. I mean, I started working on that bill, yeah, in about December 2011, and it didn't pass until December 2018. And over those seven years, very little changed in the underlying bill and structure of the bill. Um, it's, you know, we, the politics just finally lined up. Um, Say more about why, Stephen, there. Right. And, and, and particularly since you're in Texas, which or if you, you know, work, working for Senator Cornyn from Texas, you you um, uh, you may have a, a really important perspective on that, given the role that Texas did did play at the state level in showing that it was possible to have less crime and incarceration at the same time. Sure. I mean, look, what we I, I had the fortune of working down in the state legislature when we did criminal justice reform in Texas. I, um I worked for a member of the criminal justice committee in the in the state house, and what what we figured out pretty quickly was you had uh, a coalition. You had thought leaders from academia, thought leaders from civil rights groups, thought leaders from law enforcement, thought leaders from you know fiscally conservative groups, and thought leaders from religious organizations, all agreeing to the same set of facts, they agreed on what the problem was, and they generally agreed on what you had to do to address the problem. And, you know, when we saw those concentric circles intersect, we said, okay, like we have a chance to do something here, right? And uh, we had the same thing at, at the federal level. Um, it just frankly took, you know, it, it took several years to align all those things on the federal level. And then, uh, you know, it just took the right mix of, uh, you know, personalities and, you know, control of different chambers and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but I do think, you know, I do think that uh, I, I recall at the, you know, right after uh, former President Trump got elected, you know, all the writing out there was criminal justice reform is dead especially, you know, after his inauguration speech, right? Everyone said criminal justice reform is dead. It's dead, it's over. And I remember being in a meeting with, you know, uh, with a number of people who had worked on the bill and everyone just mourning the passing of the bill. And I said, you know, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily true, right? All you got to do is get one person to support it. And then all of a sudden the thing that became impossible becomes actually easier than it's ever been. Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of have the same, uh, I kind of have the same maybe misplaced optimism that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a lot less difficult than people think. Um, it, it's, it mainly turns into just a structural issue and finding, you know, finding a way for everyone to claim victory. Mm -hmm. And you can do that in, any environment, particularly in criminal justice, um, for two reasons. One, because like we do have that agreed on set of facts, um, but also because in criminal justice, there's many different subfields. There's places you can go other than the uh, other than the big hard issues that get all the media attention. Um, good examples like drug addiction policy, right? I think. You, the level of agreement on both sides on what we need to do on drug addiction treatment and policy. I mean, it's, it's astounding. And I think there's a lot you can get done there, but you know, sometimes that word criminal justice becomes politicized and you've got to find a way to talk about it as mental. It's a mental health issue or it's a drug addiction issue or it's a crime victims issue um, and try to talk about it in a less politicized way. So um, right. 
So I have a lot of optimism that, that, you know, that there can be political will to get things done. So thank, thank you for that. Um, do you, do you see, and I'm going to turn to, to Professor Garrett here with this question, but, but, um, please an, answer or, or give your, your general thoughts about this issue. Um, is based on really what Stephen just said, do you, do you see the politics as being different, um, on uh, the back end of the system and what uh, criminal justice nerds like me call, uh, the sentencing and release uh, uh, issues then at the front end of the system, uh, particularly with policing. Is there, is there a split there uh, where maybe there is a lot more consensus about the back end than there is the, the front end? And, and, and how do you see the politics of that playing out right now? I actually see a lot of bipartisan support for reforms and improvements at the front end and the back end in the middle, really. I mean, I think it's just amazing how bipartisan so many of these issues have become including uh, like what Stephen was just saying, because people see you know, early interactions with police as often being about uh, behavioral health and addiction and mental illness. You know, it, um, at, my, at my center, the Wilson Center, we're working with you know, a, a whole bunch of rural uh, sheriffs from conservative districts who really care about doing law enforcement assisted diversion, not because they wanna defund the police, but because they realize that a lot of people who interact with police are in crisis. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, a lot of traction around the country on issues surrounding bail reform, figuring that you know people's ability to pay money ba bail doesn't serve public safety and it doesn't serve people's liberty interest well. And there are obviously lots of big debates about how to do bail reform right, but that's um, you know I, I, I actually see I, I never would have thought 20 years ago that like qualified immunity reform would attract uh, so much attention on, on on both sides of the aisle. We have conservative Supreme Court justices saying, like, why have we been doing this? You know, if someone's constitutional rights are, are violated, shouldn't like a judge or jury be able to look at it at least? Um, it, it was always, you know, when I was working and teaching it in Virginia, same in North Carolina, considered to be like, you know, you just don't introduce legislation concerning police. Police are the experts. They have discretion. They're law enforcement. You don't regulate them like you do like some government agency. They're not bureaucrats. They're cops. You know, now we're seeing a flood of policing legislation introduced around the country um, with a, often endorsement of leading police professional organizations who say, yeah, like constitutional rules don't provide us guard guidance. We need sound regulation concerning people in crisis, uh, concerning use of force. We need standards. We need resources for training. And, you know, whether the George Floyd Act goes forward in, in the Senate or not, we're having, you know, it's it's a mini version of legislation which has gone forward in states all across the country. You know, we've been tracking policing legislation at my center. There's like more than a thousand bills introduced last year, you know, many times increase over, over, over prior years. On the back end, you know, we see sentencing reform continue to advance, but we also see kind of nerdy issues that no one would have expected lawmakers to really focus on uh, because of a general sort of, we don't do crime attitude in the past. Things like the, the Brady rule adopted, uh, in the fall, you know, a new rule for, for federal uh, discovery obligations. We're, we're just seeing like important issues surrounding like public defense or appellate standards or just stuff that no one would have expected anyone to focus on is getting is getting a serious look at the state level and the federal level. So I, I see this as, um, you know, I, I agree with Stephen, you know, people thought that bipartisan work on criminal justice was going to go away during the Trump administration. It didn't. Uh, things have gone forward more at the local and state level, but also because the local and state level is more important. And I, I see a lot of opportunities for federal change in the years to come as well. Do, does anybody here worry about the sort of the appropriate role of the federal government in these issues? Right, law, law enforcement in this country has has been traditionally very state state and local and and control of the state and local level, uh, but there's obviously a, a political urge and also uh, to a certain extent a political imperative at the federal level for federal lawmakers and for the national administration to, to respond and to step in, particularly where civil rights are concerned. Um, do, uh, Christine, back, back to you, are you um, what, 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 what's in your head about this as, as, uh, as these issues are, are presenting themselves today? Well, I would say that first of all, you know, let's just follow up on on what Stephen said in a very encouraging way about the area of drug policy or first contact with law enforcement. Um, we have a hearing that we're going to hold in the House Judiciary Committee next Thursday uh, on these issues. Um, and so, for those attending, I mean, I think this is our effort to kick off a, an important discussion about where 
There could be opportunities for federal legislation in these areas. Um, I, I would observe that, you know, while there's always a difficult balance between um, national policies and, and the complexity of the thousands of police jurisdictions across the country, um, there's also a need um, to have appropriate federal investments, right? And, and to set um, standards and to encourage best practices. And so I think there is a very important federal role. Um, I also think that um, I would agree with Stephen, who, you know, I've known since he first arrived to DC and he still wears his Texas cowboy boots. And, you know, it takes people like him who are really serious and, and, and persistent um, to stay focused on these issues, but also who speak directly to members of law enforcement, right? We have to have a deep appreciation and understanding of what those individuals are experiencing on the front line in order to best determine what are the appropriate allocation of resources and prioritization of areas for reform. Um, and so, for example, around interactions with individuals with mental illness, I mean, I just think that you know, we have all seen very stark and, and uh, often um, shocking video images um, that have shifted the conversation. But I would also say that there's a whole other aspect of this, of the untold invisible story in areas where we need to do a lot of work. And, and as Stephen said, I mean, I think getting into the weeds on some of these issues and trying to figure out where there may be some discrete proposals that we can work on while also acknowledging that there's a broader call for systemic reform. I think you can do both things at the same time. But also, frankly, I think we need to focus on the real problems that are identified to us by state and local leaders. Right. On, that, on that point, I obviously want to come back to some potential areas uh, for where you, where, where you all think that there uh, can be some progress in the near term. Uh, but, but in terms of what's top of mind for people like, uh, right now, and particularly for, uh, I'm going to guess, a lot, of the, um, uh, a lot of the guests and participants who are reporters here, is the increase in, in violent crime over the past year. Um, uh, we, we've uh, uh, documented that at, at, at CCJ, a uh, survey that uh, Professor Rosenfeld and, and uh, my colleague Thomas App did, surveying 34 cities, found uh, that in just those 34 mid to large size cities alone, there were 1,268 more murders in 2020 than there were in the year before, just in those cities, a 30% rise of unprecedented uh, uh, level. And of course, um, I should maybe say, of course, but, but um, the uh, vast majority of those victims are, are young uh, uh, men of color. Um, and the people who are going to be caught and convicted and sent to prison for very long terms uh, are also going to be young men of color. Um, and of course, there's a, a lot of fear that people will use uh, will, will use that to, to say that now is, now is not the time to, to, to uh, do policing reform or any other criminal justice reform. So um, maybe Stephen, to you, just uh, how how much are you hearing that? Um, how much are you being able to sort of put things in context, and uh, particularly thinking about the way I set up this conversation and the long term drop in, in in crime and where we are relative to that? How do you how do you think about not minimizing what's going on right now, uh, while also putting it in context and, and helping people understand the the urgency? Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that in some ways goes back to your question about federal role, which is, I just, I think while we can be ambitious at the federal level, I also, I think we also have to be modest and understand, you know, what our role is, but I think you have to understand what your role is, not, not to limit your policy options necessarily, but to understand what sorts of things you can actually do that are that are going to be successful and what i've found is you know typically the more ambitious we get up here um the the heart of the product is to pass but also the less effective the product will be because it just attempts to do too much too quick and once again that's not as a political matter too much too quick that's just as an administration of justice matter like the, the federal government just, you know, doesn't spend enough money on state and local law enforcement and just doesn't have power to directly regulate state and local law enforcement. So I think the very types of things that tend to be effective are, are the types of things that are more likely to get done 
just because they're modest. Um, they're, and, you know, don't mistake modesty for ineffectiveness or, or you know, lack of merit. It's just those, those tend to be the things that can get done. Um, and, you know, I, I think that works in basically any environment. Um, but look, the, the people who want to, uh, who, who want to stop reform will point to, can cherry pick bad statistics about crime and people who want to do reform can cherry pick good statistics. Right. Um, and so that's going to be the case no matter what, right? Like at any time in American history, you can find really bad crime stats and, you know, really encouraging ones. Um, so um, I think, you know, so I think it's important that we establish kind of a baseline effect that everyone can agree to. And then, you know, both sides will cherry pick, tend to cherry pick stats that, you know, benefit their argument. Um, but to your point, like I, I think that modesty always wins um, on Capitol Hill. In terms of what the federal government can accomplish in this arena. In terms... In terms of what the federal government can accomplish, mm -hmm. can effectuate in terms of actual reforms on the ground, modesty tends to work better. It brings people along. You get buy-in. But I think modesty also works as a political process matter. You're mm -hmm. just more likely to achieve something than nothing when you're modest about your goals. Professor so. Garrett, there, there are a lot of people in, 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 the, in the field of the criminal justice reform community who don't like hearing that. Um, uh, uh, being humble and and modest sounds sounds like uh, uh, sounds like you want to tinker. You don't want to you don't want to go big. You don't want to go bold. Um, what what's your what's what's your thought about that? Is, uh, uh, can we also as we're balancing a lot of things? Can we balance political realism with? Uh, I'll say is there's uh, a reason ambition? we call it. There's a reason we called it the First Step Act. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I think that. Um, with the First Step Act, um, there were all things about it that were not modest, but it was focused on fe the federal criminal system. And so I think we have to disentangle a little bit about the, the different ways that the federal government can play a role in criminal justice. One way the federal government can do it is by making the federal system itself a model and by doing things right in the federal system and states may imitate. Uh, and since you know most criminal cases are at the state level, that, that's important. <clears throat> federal government sets standards, whether it's you know, the FBI's role in forensic sciences, sometimes playing or uh, setting a standard for crime labs locally, doing training. Uh, then there's the role that federal money plays. And whether it's grant programs or supporting research, um, that, you know, that, that, that's an important federal role in criminal justice. And you can support really ambitious pilot programs by paying for them. And the federal government has long done that. I think there's a, another federal role which is the federal courts. And so whether it's federal habeas corpus or civil rights actions, right, the federal courts can be a place where constitutional abuses at the state and local level get challenged. Uh, there's yet another federal role, which is data collection. And there are some problems which are just easier to develop answers to and to track across state lines. And so the federal government has always played a role, whether it's maintaining uh, national repositories of criminal history, criminal records, the DNA data banks, and now we're talking, okay, well, you know, if we want to know about officer misconduct, do we need national decertification databases? It's not enough to have, you know, a Florida data bank if an, an officer who shoots several people gets rehired in Georgia. And so there's a coordinating and data collection function that really only the federal government can play. And so I, I, I think like in, in any area, you have to think about what are the unique strengths of the federal role and, and what are problems that are really best addressed at the local level? And maybe the federal government can provide funding and support. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing some questions uh, popping up in the chat, so it's it's uh, it's making me want to to sort of move through uh, the next part of our the next segment of our agenda, so we can get to those. Um, we've touched a little bit on policing, and so maybe rather than going through some of the some of the things that we uh, uh, that we flagged earlier, um, including policing, uh, including uh, responses to violence, including COVID, uh, <clears throat> and particularly compassionate uh, uh, and other releases. Um, and anything around First Step Act. Uh, why don't I just open it up to the three of you uh, right now and just ask you to 
um, to highlight, uh, Christine, you did a little bit ago with drugs, but to highlight um, an, uh, you know, a particular issue um, uh, where you think that there's room for agreement right now, where you're, you're anticipating uh, that something, <clears throat> something meaningful can happen, both the House and the Senate. And then each of you pick, pick the one that you want to highlight. Well, I would agree a lot with what Professor Garrett was described as far as the federal role and, and, and the need for nationwide data collection. But, and, and while we all, you know, who work on this uh, area of reform understand that the state uh, prisoner population is much larger and, and, and while there, there are notable developments that Adam mentioned at the beginning, you know, I, I, I think we can't forget at the same time the immediate needs of um, the federal prisoners and the Bureau of Prison facilities throughout the country and the crisis that they're facing in terms of managing the, the current pandemic. Um, the Inspector General has done a series of reports highlighting some concerns, particularly around um, the need for better practices and procedures for, for those that may have medical conditions or the elderly. And again, you know, within the microcosm of the federal system, mm -hmm. I think this is an urgent task. Um, it's one that we need to do in order for us to be able to set a high standard for state implementation and consideration of what kind of action should be taken during a public health emergency. I also think that this is an area where there should be broad bipartisan agreement because we have the data about recidivism rates for older offenders. Um, the Sentencing Commission, where I just came from, is the only repository for federal sentencing data. And so we, you know, there are extensive amounts of research and, and reports regarding this specific population of federal offenders that should guide us in this work. I'd also just comment briefly that, you know, there's a real need to get the right people into the right places at these agencies, including the Sentencing Commission, which has not had confirmed leadership for several years, but also throughout the Justice Department and the various subcomponents of DOJ. And that is going to require an incredible amount of serious commitment and bipartisan cooperation because we need to be able to have the people in their seats with an ability to do their jobs so that we can all move forward. Um, so I would hope that there would be lots of opportunity for bipartisanship, especially because of the qualified individuals that are being recommended for many of these positions. But again, it comes back to political goodwill and it comes back to what are, you know, what is the appropriate uh, focus for the federal government in this area? Great, thank you for that. And Christine, I would just note quickly, I think as, as, as you're aware, the, the first bipartisan task force that we assembled at the Council on Criminal Justice um, uh, put together a, a set of 15 recommendations, the first of which was to reinvigorate the U.S. Sentencing Commission and get it back on its feet and doing the job it was, uh, it was designed uh, uh, to do. Uh, Stephen, um, you picked your issue, but but um, let me just give you a, a little bit of a, a lead in there. Uh, Christine, um, start out with uh, 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 BOP, uh, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and the population there and releases. Um, I think a lot of people would be um, fairly stunned to know that out of that shift from 2.3 million to 1.8 million pr uh, people in prison and jail over, overall, uh, the federal system has been a decent part of that. The federal system was 220,000 people uh, at its peak in about 2013. Uh, it's now down to about 150,000 people, 220 down to about 150. It's a huge sort of uh, a huge drop that that, that um, occurred starting in the Obama administration and, and continued through uh, continued through Trump. Um, where does that play into um, how Senator Cornyn is thinking about um, about these issues? So, I mean, interestingly, like I, you know, I think the federal government focusing on federal reforms for uh, for so many years like with the First Step Act, right? I think was actually an example of the modesty I talked about. The federal government understood that like what we should be focusing on is cleaning up our house, setting an example. I mean, talk of that actually gets started, you know, in 2011 during a markup of the Second Chance Act reauthorization. You know, a number of Republicans said, you know, instead of doing this, we should... Uh, we should be fixing the federal system. And a number of Democrats said, I agree with you, we should fix the federal system. And then they kind of turned around to their staffs and said, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we fixing the federal system? And we said, okay, we better fix the federal system. So um, 
So uh, I guess what I would say is federal reforms, to the extent we can do meaningful federal reforms, um, you know, that that aren't politically toxic on either side, I think that's a, always a great place to start, right? I think that always has to be our starting point is like, what can the federal, go before we go and start telling the states what they need to be doing, let's try to perfect our system as much as is politically viable, right? So that's kind of where I start on everything. Um, but then, you know, then you can kind of move down to the state level issues. Um, and, you know, a lot of these issues, the federal problem and the state problem are just very different, right? And the federal government's role is just very different. Um, but, you know, you talked earlier uh, about, uh, you know, kind of front end versus back end. Um, and so my view is that, you know, we, we got into these talks of front end versus back end on First Step Act, and then front end was sentencing and back end was kind of the recidivism reduction mm -hmm. in prison. So I, you know, I, to some, I might sound like a broken record, but it's, it's not linear, it's circular, right? Like the system is a, is a circle, not a line. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, and you, you, you know, so I think, you know, I, I think, and the reason I say that is because, you know, I, I don't think sentencing is the back end, right? We have, I think the actual issues where we can make the most progress are kind of hard to place on, on a, on a linear line. And I think that's your reentry yeah. stuff, um, mental health, drug addiction, which kind of things that you have to work on at multiple points in, in the system, wherever they fall on either the line or the circle. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think the federal government, I think we've shown on those issues, like through second chance act, through CARA, through a number of other things that we can actually like make big differences when, when we work on those issues. And, you know, everyone kind of asks, what's the second step now? What's, what's, you know, federal prison and sentencing reform were the first step. What's the second step? Well, I think the second step is, you know, I, I think, you know, query whether it's federal reentry um, or query whether we can do more with reentry and mental health and drug addiction at the state level. But mm -hmm. I think those are the types of issues that just become easier lifts for a number of um, both political and policy reasons that, you know, I don't need to go into now, but I think those tend to be safer places for people on uh, on both sides and where we can get a lot of bang for the buck, so to speak. Perfect. Professor Garrett, your thoughts on this and then we'll go to Q&A. We should go to Q&A, but you know, I, I yeah. certainly agree with what Christine said. Um, I mean, the, the problem of the, the, the tiny trickle of uh, releases to home confinement, compassionate release during COVID in the federal system has been a, just symptomatic of what's happened uh, across the country where you, you have a lot of bipartisan agreement that people who are elderly, people who are vulnerable don't belong in prisons, that reducing crowding in prisons is the wise thing to do during the pandemic. Uh, and you know you had Bill Barr responding immediately as attorney general to the CARES Act saying, make this happen. And federal prisons haven't been able to make it happen, and neither have state prisons. They just aren't equipped. I don't. I, don't, I, just, I think part of it is like there isn't a person who can sit and read individual applications all week and process them. They're literally not able to process paper because these are not systems that are equipped to release more than a handful of people at a time, and they're not equipped to do that except when a judge says, "Oh, the person's sentence is over." Right? Yeah. The sentence is over. There's an automatic release. Uh, you know, our system is built to mass incarcerate. It's not built to release people at any kind of scale. Um, and that's just a problem. It's a huge problem. Uh, the National Academy of Scientists produced a really interesting report in the fall describing just, we need community corrections. We need to be set up for reentry and release and not just a handful of people here and there. Um, and that's something which I think, particularly during a pandemic, but very much before the pandemic, given the focus on reentry and bringing people back to communities, I, I see that as a, it already has been a bipartisan issue. It's important during a pandemic, but it's important no matter what. We need to actually figure out how to decarcerate in a way that works. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, here in North Carolina, we, our, our local district attorney, a 
Duke Law alum, uh, agreed to um, a set of individual motions. There's a couple dozen people at this point who are granted uh, release uh, from their sentences, early release, um, including for COVID reasons. And the work that had to go into just releasing a couple dozen people was just astonishing when he talked to the prisoners' legal services lawyers. Uh, because, you know, the prison had never seen an order like that before. And they call back and they say, what is this? And uh, just all the arrangements that had to be made to release a couple dozen people, uh, it, it, they're just not set up for this. Yeah. And it's, and it's so an embarrassment you... at the federal level and it's an embarrassment at the local level. And I see the federal government being able to play, again, be, be a role model here, but also maybe right. provide support to community decarceration efforts through grant making. Right. So just talking about the federal level for, for a second here um, and going to a question that's in the that it's in the Q&A uh, about second look here um, uh, and staying with you, uh, Professor, Professor Garrett, um, is, is that something you favor? Um, uh, it, it, do, you, do you think the president needs to be, make more aggressive use of a clemency authority? What, um, how, how, would, how would you approach this and then coming to Christine and Stephen afterwards uh, for, yeah. for your thoughts? I mean, I think there, there are a lot of ways that one can have a second look at criminal cases, and clemency is one way. Another way is to reinvigorate uh, you know, at the state level uh, parole functions or having sentences that are less determinate um, or creating avenues for judges to you know, grant compassionate release and the like. Um, and I think you know, in general, you don't want sort of sentence review authority to be concentrated in one place and you want it to be a professional decision and not a political decision. And so I think there's, there's been a lot of good thought in recent years on how to re revive that function, which kind of disappeared when so many states moved away from indeterminate sentencing. Christine, your thoughts? Well, I think that, again, mm -hmm. could, we, could we approach this from a common set of facts? And you know, in the, in the federal system right now, half of the offenders are there be because of drug offenses. And, you know, many of them had no criminal history uh, or were first time offenders. And yet because of longstanding mandatory minimum penalties, they have faced incredibly long sentences. And so, you know, to Professor Garrett's point about, you know, what would be the right menu of options? I mean, I think one of the considerations here is to look at other areas where there have been attempts to do broad reform, yet allowing for individual discretion and review and the execution of those um, policies. So for example, Judge Patty Saris, as the chair of the Sentencing Commission, led the effort around drugs minus two. Currently 60,000 uh, individuals have benefited from a sentencing reduction at the federal level because of those policies. But the way that it was implemented um, did not uh, cause a, a, a tremendous outcry because there was consultation with the Bureau of Prisons to have a delayed implementation of one year in order for the system to prepare. Because as Pro Professor Garrett said, you, ne you need to allow for that, for the systems to be in place for people to return to their communities. But also there was a very significant aspect of that process that I think is very important to remember as we're looking at all types of uh, reform across the criminal justice system was that the individuals who were benefiting had to go back before the court and they had an individual review by a federal judge that, that allowed consideration of public safety factors for each individual case. Mm -hmm. And I think if we approach solutions from that framework where, you know, each individual should not be out there trying to litigate their own individual remedy, right? That is not the kind of change we wanna see. And I'm not disagreeing with Stephen that we need to also think about incremental approaches, but what we should be striving for is a national system of fairness and justice for all. So I think if we come up with these comprehensive solutions, whatever options might be considered, that we also have to drill down to the details of implementation, because otherwise we won't have the magnitude of impact that we could, but we actually could have some pretty significant unintended consequences for individuals who do not have access to a lawyer. And so beyond any existing racial disparities, we could have a continuation of the, the disparate socioeconomic aspect of our criminal justice policies in this country. Thank you. Um, Steve, do you want to jump in on that or, or are you happy to go to one of the Q&A? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll just jump in just briefly. I mean, I don't, 
I don't disagree. I mean, I agree with a lot of what Professor Garrett and Christine have, have said. Um, I just think the trick in, when you're talking about, you know, review of previous sentences and things like that, I just think the trick is focusing that, right? Like that that's where things get really challenging, right? Is, you know, we can all look at a risk assessment tool and, you know, see who's low risk and who's not. And I think you know, you just have to focus it on the truly egregious cases, right? Um, and work and and work from there, right? It, because there's a big difference between an egregious sentence and an unfair sentence, and we shouldn't be okay with the unfair sentence. But in order to get to the unfair sentence, we have to be focused in how we move in that direction. I think, right? And we have to make sure there's we're working to build consensus as to what is an unfair sentence and what isn't, and it, it gets tricky. Indeed. Um, all right, there's a question in the, in the Q&A from Francisco. I'm gonna, uh, looking over here, given the decriminalization of marijuana happening in the states, uh, do you anticipate any changes in this regard at the federal level? Uh, um, while you're thinking about who wants to jump in first on that, um, I would just note quickly, I did put in the chat the recommendations of the CCJ Federal Priorities Task Force, and this is, this is another one of them to create to create sort of a federal uh, waiver system uh, like there are for some uh, some other issues for states that have uh, decriminalized or legalized so that there, there, there can be some bridging of this gap between uh, federal policy and, and where the states are. Uh, but what what, uh, um, uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Professor Garrett? Do um, you want to jump in on marijuana? Well, we've certainly seen more states legalized in recent years. Uh, we've also seen efforts to just kind of decriminalize versus legalize or just decisions by local prosecutors that marijuana cases aren't worth taking or they're worth diverting and the like. And so we've seen a real sea change. Um, it's been really important when looking at those efforts to make sure uh, to be attentive to the, 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 the really pronounced racial disparities and who gets arrested for, for marijuana offenses. And that's been a driver for reform in many states. Um, it, I think it's just part of what Stephen was talking about, just a wholesale rethinking of how we approach uh, mental illness, addiction in this country. Uh, we responded with, you know, jail time in the past to what I think people increasingly realize are, are, are medical issues. And, and I think that's, that's really positive. I think that's become bipartisan. Um, that people understand that, that responding to whether it's drug addiction, or behavioral health writ large. Often it's a combination of mental health and drug addiction that produces people in, in really profound crisis. Um, that, that, you know, putting people in jail doesn't solve the problem. And, uh, and so that, that, that's really, really positive. And I see that as, again, something that, that there's going to be a lot of momentum across the country, like, like there has been. Um, and, uh, and that's obviously just a huge sea change from how kind of the national approach towards a, you know, war on drugs in the 1980s. Stephen, Christine. Well, Christine, I'll just speak briefly uh, on, on this issue of decriminalization. I mean, the House did pass the MORE Act at the end of the last Congress. You know, it, it is a very significant part of the conversation to think about decriminalization of marijuana at the federal level, because this is an unavoidable discussion given where the states are headed. Um, and, you know, it will be important uh, once the new attorney general is in place to see how that conflict between state and federal law will get worked out, as well as uh, prosecutorial priorities for some of these cases, given how the states uh, where it's legal, uh, there is a conflict right there. Um, but I also think it's really important to look at the goals of the MORE Act that went beyond just discriminalization and looked at the, the harms that Professor Garrett mentioned to the communities that have been most adversely impacted by the war on drugs and the need for reinvestment back into those communities and to think about how we can bring different parties to this economic conversation that's happening in various states around this industry and to see if we can try to bring more uh, people from those impacted communities to the table in order that they can be part of the economic boom that's happening. Um, and, you know, I think, again, this is an issue where if you look back, um, you know, even to when former Speaker Boehner was still in the House, you know, it, it, there, this, there was a very different political climate. And so I, I think that that's an area that is really important for this Congress. And, you know, there's been a lot of press reports about where the Senate may be more willing to take up this issue. 
Um, and so I would, I hope that that's an issue that perhaps Steve and I will get to work on together. Um, well, I'll just say Senator Cornyn and Senator Feinstein, they're co-chairs of the Senate caucus on narcotics control. We just released a report yesterday on uh, with several bipartisan recommendations on marijuana policy that's nothing earth shattering, um, but you know, once again, incremental and modest as, as is my, as is our, our, our way, our manner. Um, but the one thing I will say on marijuana policy, like, you know, listen, states, laboratories of democracies, I, I think it's great. We can, we can learn a lot from the state experiences but you know, one thing I do, I do think m most acknowledge is our research on marijuana is way behind. That listen, that's caused by federal policies for a very long time, um, and you know, marijuana and the developing brain and things like that. Um, I, I think concern us, and I'm not you know, I'm not shutting down working on the issue because of that. But I'm saying as we we work to reform our drug mm -hmm. laws, make changes. Like I do, you know, I think my boss has some concern that we just want to make sure we are not doing something that's going to make the addiction problem worse. Because I think, you know, I, I speak for myself and maybe my boss when I say that I, so, so many problems in our justice system flow from an addiction problem. And we want to make sure that, you know, we, you know, as we reform marijuana laws in a way that don't, uh, that don't cause or minimizes the additional issues cause. So. Thank you. Um, there's a related question and a Q and A, maybe the last one that, that we get to about pretrial. Um, and I, and I go to it right now just, uh, because I think it was a link between the marijuana, marijuana issue and, and pretrial issue, because, uh, most people who are arrested for marijuana um, and, and do get held <clears throat> get held in jail, but very few uh, very few make it to prison, right? Uh, Christine mentioned before that half the federal uh, prison population is is drug offenders. Um, at the state level, it's about fifteen percent for all drug offenses in state prison, and <clears throat> for possession cases, it's it's about three and a half percent. Uh, or so of all state prisoners are in for possession. And that's not just of marijuana, that's marijuana, cocaine, heroin, meth, all, all, all of the drugs about, about three and a half percent. So the, the, the extent to which marijuana leads directly to uh, right, incarceration issues is mostly a pretrial issue. So the question in the chat uh, or in the Q&A here from Adrian is given states varying levels of responsiveness to the coronavirus pandemic, there are still many individuals who are awaiting adjudication and pretrial detention. Can the federal government play a more responsive role in pretrial detention issues rather than just allowing the process to play out through the court system? Who wants to feel that? It's hard because obviously local jails and policy surrounding them are a matter of maybe state kind of pretrial and bail law, local judges making bail determinations, magistrates. Uh, there is a role that federal funding has played in the expansion of local jails because, you know, there's a healthy federal per diem that gets paid to local sheriffs and the like, which has helped to fund the expansion of a lot of jails uh, in places that don't have a lot of like local needs in, ter in terms of detaining federal prisoners, ICE detainees and the like. So there's, I think, a question like, do we want to be subsidizing um, with whatever it is, $100 per head per day, you know, a type of healthy federal subsidies to, to local jail facilities? Um, there was a, uh, I, I play a, in terms of the role of the federal courts, um, litigation can be slow. Um, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm the monitor of the Harris County, Texas federal law of consent decree concerning bail reform, the O'Donnell case, which relates to misdemeanors in Harris County. Um, and, uh, and it took, you know, years of litigation before that consent decree was resolved. It's produced really positive effects. And I think it, it shows how, how, um, local efforts can make a difference. Um, we just had our year-end report come out yesterday, and you know, there, uh, the district attorney's office has independently in Harris County decided to divert, you know, marijuana misdemeanors. So there's been a real decline. You know, many thousands of fewer misdemeanor um, arrestees because of that policy surrounding marijuana misdemeanors. 
And on top of that, there's this whole bail reform consent decree where you know the the vast majority of people arrested on misdemeanors are are booked and released. They do not end up in the jail. And the others get a more robust hearing, more serious process to decide whether there really is a public safety flight reason to hold them in the jail. And so the misdemeanor jail population has gone way down in Harris County. And we've seen that repeat offending has either stayed the same or declined. So many more people have their freedom. The results have been really positive, both in terms of fairness and re repeat offending. Um, and there are other examples like this around the country where, where these bail reforms have been shown to really work. But what the federal role is, harder to say, aside from, yeah, maybe the federal courts here and there may step in if cash bail systems are found to be unconstitutional. Um, there's this question of federal subsidies to jails, but the federal government could also be an example again, because federal pretrial det det you know, detention hasn't, hasn't gone well. You know, the um, federal sentencing reporter keeps issuing uh, interesting empirical studies by BJS and others showing that like, you know, federal judges kind of tend to ignore the risk assessment and can tend to just kind of detain everyone. Detention rates have gone up uh, despite efforts to try to give judges more information about the actual risk that federal pretrial detainees act pose. And so um, there's a lot of like work at home that the federal government can do and maybe some questions about the role federal funding can play. I can imagine, you know, some creative ways to um, incentivize a federal role in litigation against unconstitutional bail practices, but it's, it's got to mostly be at the state and local level. Okay. Um, Adam, can I just say something quickly on that issue? Of course. Um, Chairman Nadler has had a longstanding issue, interest in bail reform and did introduce legislation at the end of last Congress. But I think Adrian raises a really smart and important question that may touch upon um, the complexities of, of some of the challenges of doing this type of legislation at the federal level. But I, I, I guess that what I would just add um, to Professor Garrett's comments is that um, looking beyond even pretrial detention, I think that there's a need to also look about first contact with law enforcement period, right? And, and what the research has shown us about the impact uh, that arrests can have on, our, on certain communities, but particularly on young people. And so I think um, this is a really important discussion, but, it, but I would say, you know, I hope that there'll be opportunities to start the conversation about even the earliest uh, encounters with law enforcement. And, and as Stephen raised at the beginning, you know, what are the appropriate responses and who uh, should be involved? I mean, but, but this is an important part for where the work lies ahead. I'll just chime in and say, Professor Garrett used one of my favorite terms in criminal justice policy, which is risk assessment. Um, I do think the federal government, like I think we've had a lot of success uh, I think there's a lot of buy-in on the idea of using risk assessment at more points in the criminal justice system. Um, I, I think that's something I've seen both sides of the aisle can kind of embrace for, you know, sometimes completely different reasons. But I think that's a place where the federal government can play a role is helping, you know, build better risk assessment tools, you know, given our data coordination function and also helping states implement those risk assessment tools. and you know, helping teach them these aren't, you know, scary, magical devices that uh, are hard to use. Um, that yeah. they, they just save money and increase safety using facts. So I will say this may be too in the weeds, but I think one of the real great things about the First Step Act was the detail and the thought that got put into some of the provisions saying that this risk assessment tool needs to be validated. The, the data needs to be reviewed periodically. Independent people need to be brought in to review it. And unfortunately, that hasn't really played out in terms of how it's been administered so far. Like independent researchers have no access to the data. And there are a lot of questions about how cutoff points are even selected. Reports haven't been particularly transparent. And I, I feel like lawmakers put as much thought and have put as much clear language as you could imagine into the legislation. Uh, and I think there's uh, um, the legislation is a model, the implementation hasn't been, and there's more work that can be done. Uh, but there's a separate concern is that, you know, no one ever forces judges to follow these risk assessment tools. And there may be other information that they have, which is really valuable and adds to the picture. Uh, but what we've also seen in some places is that the way judges use risk assessment uh, may make the situation worse or they just ignore it. Uh, I've done a series of studies. Virginia was a model, an early adoption of risk assessment to divert low-level offenders to the community. And, and judges have, like, you know, almost wholly ignored it. 
even though it's in the sentencing guidelines. You think like, where, what a better place to put it here, sentencing guidelines, you can divert low level offenders. And it's often that judges are saying like, we don't wanna divert people or we only wanna divert them if there's extensive community supervision and there's just no treatment in my district. And so I'm gonna, jail is a better place for that person to be. It's like, wait a minute, they're low risk. They don't need to be anywhere. But, but uh, I think there's a lot of sort of cultural attitude that lawyers have to like numbers and quantitative information, which raises challenges when you try to introduce these tools and give judges other ways of thinking about their decision-making. Well, we can do a bill to the federal government can help teach social science to lawyers that. Uh... <laughs> my, my, that new book is about friend, indeed. my new book is about forensic science and all the issues with forensic science in our court system. And they're just, there are lots of problems in terms of lawyers, <laughs> lawyers being almost wholly statistically illiterate uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, judges letting stuff in because I don't know, I, I know what a fingerprint is, seems fine to me. And it's just, it's a problem. We don't go to law school because we know anything about numbers. That's right. I'd be re uh, remiss uh, not to point out, I think both of you were hinting at this, but I just want to sort of say it directly here that uh, um, uh, for, for the group that there obviously are concerns about risk assessments carrying some racial taint, the extent to which uh, um, uh, there was a lot of policing in neighborhoods and a lot of people got swept up, uh, particularly for drug offenses that now sort of tally and count in these risk and these risk assessments. Um, you know, my my personal view is that's easy enough to fix by essentially just not counting them. Right? If somebody's been arrested a bunch of times for drug possession and you don't want to lock up people for drug possession, then you then you just remove those arrests from the, the risk calculation. That person's not necessarily at risk for uh, for a violent offense per se, uh, but but this is obviously a, um, uh, um, uh, an issue that's carrying um, you know a lot of uh, a lot of emotion uh, right now uh, when it's when it's uh, and, and legitimately so. Um, though it is a, of course, uh, an attempt to really uh, base decisions in criminal justice on science and evidence. Um, so it's, it's really one of the fascinating areas and I'll see a lot more work to do on it at the, at the federal level. Um, maybe, that's, maybe that's a way, and, and, um, um, and I'm gonna apologize to Steve, I thought we were done at 10.15, we had 10.30, so I, I sort of prematurely said a few minutes ago we were winding down, but we do have uh, uh, about 10 more minutes here now. And, uh, based on the questions in the Q&A, there are a couple that, that speak to sort of the opposite end of the offense spectrum, if you will. We've been talking about the very front end, pretrial of marijuana, a couple of questions in here uh, relating to violent offenses. And I guess I, I would just smoosh them together in a way um, uh, and ask the question uh, this way, which is uh, everybody at this point recognizes, particularly since drug offenses, uh, at least at the state level, have shrunk down to, uh, to a fairly small portion, that any large reductions in uh, really larger reductions in the, the overall prison population are going to happen if and only if severe sentences, particularly for violent offenses, are reduced uh, either proactively and or uh, retroactively. Um, and so the question is, uh, for, for you all, is are violent offenses still a third rail um, uh, in Washington? I don't think they're a third rail in Washington or in other places. Um, I mean, talk about third rail, like Virginia just uh, repealed the death penalty. <laughs> I never thought I would see that, that happen. Um, but part of the reason why it has to do with public opinion and jurors, and you know, there hasn't been a death sentence uh, in Virginia since 2011. Uh, it's withered away on the vine and certainly homicide rates have declined, but there are still murders and you know, there's still plenty of capital eligible offenses in a big state like the Commonwealth of Virginia. And it just hasn't been the kind of hot button political issue that it was in the past where your view on the death penalty really mattered in politics. It was a litmus test. You know, now we regularly have governors, we have you know, a president who ran for office saying, I don't, I don't particularly believe that the death penalty makes sense. But uh, there's been much more discussion um, of life sentencing, life without parole sentencing. There's been a surge of life without parole sentencing in this country. Uh, and it's not like there's this surge in crime that justifies it. You know, why, why would we have 10, more life without, 10 times more life without parole sentences today than 20 years ago? We don't have 10 times more, you know, first degree murders happening, uh, but it's just, you know, it's just uh, those, those sentences can be mandatory if you're not talking about juveniles. Uh, you don't have the kind of lawyering that you do in a death penalty case if it's, if it's just life without parole that's on the table. And so a lot of counties have just gone wild with life without parole sentences, imposing huge costs because these are people who, you know, could not spend longer in, in prison. Um, 
you see the same kind of race disparities, just county level district attorney preference type disparities that people focused on as raising constitutional questions in the death penalty context and in the juvenile life without parole context. Mm -hmm. But we have a huge adult lifer population and COVID has kind of brought out like, well, why, you know, do we really need to keep these people in prison for, for 60 years? Uh, and, I, and I think that actually at the most serious end of the criminal spectrum, there's a lot of new thinking about what's appropriate. You agree, Christine? I'll let Stephen go first. Mm. <laughs> uh, so cutting sentences for violent offenders, that's about as close to the third rail as you're going to get in, in Washington. Um, that being said, like, you know, I, an acknowledgement that you have to do something about violent offenders. I mean, I think, you know, I think one conversation we've engaged in before is, you know, earn time credits for people who, you know, get, you know, don't cut the sentences on the front end, but, you know, when they come into the system, demonstrate good behavior, demonstrate they've, you know, taken control of their life. I, you know, they can, in fact, serve less time through earned time credits. And then I think the other trick with, you know, certain types of violent offenses is, you know, what you do on the reentry side, right? Like stepping down, stepped down levels of incarceration um, so that we don't, you know, have the public safety risks, but we are thinking in terms of reintegrating the person because, I think everyone would agree that like, if you just lock up a violent person and, you know, most federal sentences aren't 20 to life like everyone thinks, right? Like average person in a federal prison is serving like, you know, year and a half. I think the average violent offender is under five years. So they're coming back out. Um, and I, so I think you can start with that kind of baseline that, Mm -hmm. Most of these guys are going to be released, so mm -hmm. shouldn't we do something to, you know, make prison less of a punitive experience and more of a reformative experience? And I think once you stipulate to that, that, yeah, prison should be a reformative experience, not fully punitive, you can have a conversation about, like, okay, how, how do we, you know, examine the fairness underlying some of these sentences? Well, I would just want to highlight and acknowledge how significant it is that Stephen Towson, as a senior staffer to the senator from Texas, is bringing up rehabilitation as part of the conversation for the federal criminal justice system, right? I mean, that's what this is all about in terms of figuring out where we can work together. And I think to a lot of, um, in terms of the broader conversation, demystifying and debunking a lot of this, you know, scary rhetoric. Um, I think, you know, when you talk about violent offenses, for me, what is really important is, you know, what, which offenses are you talking about? Um, you know, the average sentence length for federal offenders, Stephen's right, generally, but for drug offenders, it's eight years, okay? And, and the Sentencing Commission has done research to document that drug trafficking offenders are different. Uh, than other types of career offenders. And so I think one way to approach this conversation is by being specific where we can about the data. I mean, looking at the recidivism data rates for individuals for different kinds, kinds of crimes, it's, it, 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 it speaks for itself. And so I think to the degree that we can um, break out this conversation with a little bit more clarity it will really help educate both members of Congress, but also for those uh, being patient enough to listen to this panel today. I mean, I think it's also about educating the public. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of really good work going on by organizations like the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth to try and talk about, you know, what has um, an individual done at one point in their life and how they might be able to be viewed differently at a later point in their life. I mean, another issue that I think is really important to um, just acknowledge as part of where we go from here is that, you know, President Biden has a longstanding record on the Violence Against Women Act. And so, you know, we do need to take into consideration um, those issues relating to crime victims and thinking about their perspective and, and, and their experiences 
But I also think, you know, from my time at the Vera Institute of Justice, that we need to push forward about the broader conversation about who crime victims are and in, in discussions around restorative justice. And, you know, as Stephen said, you know, many of these um, individuals who are involved in these uh, incidents, including violent offenses, have also been crime victims themselves or had traumatic experiences in their lives. And so, you know, I think that this is sort of the next uh, breakthrough area where we have to go. And, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that, you know, Stephen and I spent a lot of time in windowless rooms talking about risk assessment tools almost, you know, eight or nine years ago. And I, I would just want to emphasize that, you know, it's really important that we're having that detailed conversation. But at the same time, there is a lot of concern about where those tools get used throughout the system, as Adam mentioned. So, you know, there, but again, isn't this progress that we're having a substantive discussion around evidence-based tools and, you know, trying to create solutions based on data? I, I think that that's, gives me a lot of hope um, that we could even bridge some of these more difficult conversations about the types of crimes or mistakes that people have made. What a terrific note to, to, to end this panel on, Christine. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to you, to Stephen, uh, Professor Garrett as well. I, I, I really enjoyed the discussion. and hope, hope we uh, we reach the bar here. What we're trying to do to, to, to put some facts and, and on the table and, and have a serious, honest conversation about, about where we are. So terrific end on a hopeful note. And I'll just say, Steve, by turning, turning it back over to you that, um, uh, sorry, I didn't get to, to a number of the questions in the chat, but the, the ones that I did skip are ones that uh, I feel like um, you've got covered in some of the upcoming panels uh, about police and about state level, uh, state level reforms. And, and I, uh, former colleagues and friends at Pew and, and the CSG Justice Center will be, uh, will, will be on later and, and uh, have a great, great uh, opportunity to, to get to those issues. So Steve, yeah, thank back you. over to you. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Um, and thank you to Brandon, Christine, and Stephen for a wonderful panel. And just echoing um, what Adam just said, we will bundle any of the questions that weren't asked and we'll send them uh, to the panelists and if they'd be gracious uh, enough, they can reply in their own good time and we will then publish them. But, Again, thank you all. We'll take a short 10-minute uh, coffee break or stretch your legs break, and we'll be back on at 1045. Thank you. Thank you.